Hello, my name is Morgan Lima. I am a registered nurse and I have partnered with Picmonic to bring you this video describing the head to toe assessment that you may complete as a nurse. This video will go into details about the different systems of the body and how to assess for abnormalities. As always, you can follow me on Instagram at the teachable nurse or visit my website, www.theteachablenurse.com for nursing and nursing school related content and resources. First, let's go over the equipment that you will need for the head to toe assessment. You will need a stethoscope, a blood pressure cuff, a pen light, a reflex hammer, tongue depressor, and possibly an otoscope and ophthalmoscope. Now I'm going to discuss the techniques used during assessment because you're going to hear me use these terms throughout the video. First is inspection. Inspection is a visual assessment of the patient and how they look. Do they look disheveled, well-groomed? What is their posture like? Next, we have palpitation. This means using your hands to feel the patient. Use light pressure to palpate areas like the skin when checking for fluid retention and seeing edema level. You can also use palpitation when palpating areas that are tender or possibly an injured muscle. Deep pressure is used when palpating areas deeper like organs such as the liver. The nurse will press about four or five centimeters for deep palpitation. Then we have percussion. The nurse uses tapping and vibrations to assess for the presence of air, fluid, or solids in the body. Lastly, we have auscultation. This involves using tools like a stethoscope to listen to organs like the heart, abdomen, and lungs. When assessing your patient, always be sure to perform hand hygiene and provide privacy to the patient. Always explain what you're going to do before doing anything to the patient as well. Beginning with the head, inspect the shape. The shape of the head should be round and normocephalic, meaning not microcephalic or macrocephalic, too small or too large. Palpate the skull. The skull should be smooth and without any masses, bumps, or depressions when palpated. Inspect the face. The face should be symmetrical and have no nodules or masses present. Next, assess the patient's eyes. When assessing eyes, it's helpful to remember the acronym PERLA, P-E-R-R-L-A. Pupils should be round, equal, and reactive to light and accommodation. They should also accommodate to objects when they are brought closer and further away. Check for any drainage. Drainage can be a sign of infection or allergy. Are they too dry? If the mucous membranes are dry, this could indicate dehydration. Notice the color of the conjunctiva. The sclera should be white and the bottom part of the eye when you have them pull their socket down should be pink. This is known as palpebral conjunctiva. Assess the patient's ability to see from a distance by having them stand 20 feet from a Snellen chart and read the letters line by line. This assesses the patient's optic nerve or cranial nerve too. Assess the patient's reaction to light using a pen light from distal to proximal and checking the pupillary response. A normal pupillary response is two to four millimeters when a light is shown. Both pupils should be equal in diameter. They should constrict when the light is shown and dilate in the dark or absence of the pen light. If the pupillary response is not equal on both sides, this could indicate a neurological impairment. Next, you will test the six cardinal fields of gaze by holding the pen light out in front of their face and asking them to follow the pen with their gaze, only their eyes, not their head. You will move the pen light from the upper right to the lower left from the upper left to the lower right, and then from right to left. This assessment tests the oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens nerves, also known as cranial nerves three, four, and six. Moving downward, you will assess the patient's nose. Ask the patient if they have had any trouble breathing through their nose. If they have congestion, is it clear or is it yellow or green? Yellow or green could indicate an infection. Is one nostril more congested than the other? 
You may need to refer them to an ear, nose, and throat specialist or ENT if you suspect the patient has a deviated septum. Assessing a patient's ability to smell is assessing their olfactory nerve, also known as cranial nerve one. Next, inspect the patient's mouth. Have the patient open their mouth and say, ah, this assesses the patient's glossopharyngeal nerve, also known as cranial nerve nine. Use your pen light to inspect the uvula and mucous membranes inside the mouth. You can also use a tongue depressor to keep the tongue down during this inspection. These mucous membranes should appear pink, but not red. They should appear moist. If they appear dry, this could indicate dehydration. Look for any sores or white patches. White patches can sometimes indicate infection like candidiasis, which is a fungal infection. Have their patients stick out their tongue and move side to side. This tests the hypoglossal nerve, also known as cranial nerve 12. Look for white patches on the tongue. The tongue should be pink and moist, and the tonsils should appear pink but not red or inflamed. To assess the vagus nerve or cranial nerve 10, you may use a cotton swab to touch the back of the uvula. And this should trigger a gag reflex. Now you will move on to the patient's neck. Palpate the lymph nodes of the neck using your middle three fingers on both hands. Start from the chin and go to the back of the neck. The lymph nodes should feel symmetrical and like two millimeter marbles. Be careful not to accidentally compress the jugular vein. If the patient is experiencing pain, they may have an infection in those lymph nodes. Feel for any enlarged lymph nodes and inspect both sides of the neck for any bulging masses. To assess the trigeminal nerve, have the patient close their eyes and place a cotton ball or cotton gauze on their face, forehead, and chin. Have the patient say yes every time they feel it. Next, have the patient smile for you while clenching their teeth. This tests the sensory and motor functions of the patient's trigeminal nerve. And the trigeminal nerve is also known as cranial nerve 5. To assess the spinal accessory nerve, also known as cranial nerve 11, have the patient shrug their shoulders while placing your hands on them, pushing them down. Next, have them turn their head side to side by applying pressure or resistance to their cheek. Inspect to see if the patient's trachea is midline. Next, you're going to check for jugular vein distension, also known as JVD. To do this, have the patient turn their head one side to the other and see if you can see that jugular vein pulsating. Next, assess the patient's ears and hearing. Ask the patient if they have had any difficulty hearing recently. Assess for tinnitus or vertigo by asking if they've experienced ringing in their ears or dizziness without any cause. An efficient way to assess a patient's hearing is through the whisper test. With this test, the nurse stands at an arm's length behind the patient. Be sure you stand behind them to prevent any lip reading. Ask the patient to cover one ear. You, the nurse, exhale. Then, whisper as quietly as possible a combination of letters and numbers. For example, 5P8. If they cannot repeat this, whisper again using different numbers and letters. If they get at least three correct, they have passed the test. Repeat with the other ear with a different combination of letters and numbers. You will also test the patient's ability to balance using the Romberg test. Have the patient stand with their feet together and eyes closed. If they begin to fall, be sure you're nearby to steady them. These tests assess the patient's vestibulocochlear nerve, also known as cranial nerve 8. Now, let's move on to the respiratory system. After ensuring privacy, ask the patient to lift their shirt or their gown so you can see their chest. Is it smooth or concave or convex? Ask them to breathe in and out normally and watch their chest rise. Is it rising evenly on both sides? Are they short and rapid breaths or are they even and deep? Your stethoscope has a diaphragm and a bell. This larger circle is the diaphragm and the smaller one is the bell. You're typically going to use the diaphragm of the stethoscope, but you will use the bell for some things and I'll talk about that a little later on. So using your stethoscope's diaphragm, listen to the patient's lung sounds on their interior chest on 10 places bilaterally. Then do the same thing 
posteriorly. When listening to their breath sounds, make note of how they sound. Do they sound diminished or can you hear them easily? Diminished lung sounds could indicate pneumothorax, collapsed lung, or atelectasis. If you hear crackles, this could indicate fluid in the lungs, which could indicate things like COPD or pulmonary edema. Be sure to know where in the lungs you hear the crackles, because if there's fluid in the upper lobes, you need to ask the patient if they're able to cough up any sputum. If the crackles are in the lower lobes, this could lead to infection, and you would want to consult with the physician to see if a breathing treatment is indicated to help the patient break up that fluid so that it doesn't lead to things like pneumonia. Wheezing could indicate emphysema, asthma, or bronchitis. If you hear a creaking sound, this is indicative of a friction rub, and that's commonly noted in something called pleurisy. Assess the patient's oxygen saturation by using a pulse oximeter. This can tell you how well oxygenated the hemoglobin, or red blood cells, are in the bloodstream. These red blood cells are responsible for carrying oxygenated blood throughout the body, and a typical reading is 95% or above. Next, we will assess the cardiac system. Assess the color of the patient's skin. If there are signs of cyanosis or blue discoloration, this could indicate poor perfusion or circulation. You can check the patient's capillary refill by squeezing the patient's fingertip and watching how quickly that color returns. Normal capillary refill is less than three seconds, and this helps the nurse get an idea of how well the patient is perfusing. The nurse should obtain vital signs to understand their heart rate and blood pressure, and these should be compared with a baseline from a previous visit or just per patient report. Using the diaphragm, again, of the stethoscope, auscultate the patient's heart sounds. You should hear a lub-dub sound, also known as S1 and S2 heart sounds, when listening to the apical pulse. You can identify the apical pulse by placing the stethoscope in between the fourth and fifth intercostal spaces. After you've done that, listen to the heart at the following valves. The aortic valve, the pulmonary valve, then herbs point, then the tricuspid valve, and finally the mitral valve. And when you're assessing the mitral valve, you can use the bell of the stethoscope and listen again and see if you hear any sort of presence of a murmur. Continue assessing perfusion throughout the body by expecting the patient's extremities for edema. Edema at the lower extremities can indicate cardiac conditions like heart failure. Edema has different levels to it and can be classified by 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, and 4 plus pitting edema. Finally, assess the patient for jugular distension, also known as JVD. Like I mentioned before, have the patient turn their head so you can see the jugular vein. If it is distended more than three centimeters when the patient is sitting at a 45 degree angle, which is typically what they're doing in a hospital bed, this could indicate cardiac failure. After the cardiac assessment comes the abdominal assessment. Begin the inspection of the abdomen by noting the general color of the patient's skin. If there are yellow tints to the skin or whites of the eyes, this may indicate issues with liver function. Next, palpate the abdomen for any masses. This could indicate problems like a hernia. If a hernia is suspected, the nurse can ask the patient to cough while palpating that mass, and this will result in the hernia pulsating. Using the diaphragm of the stethoscope, the nurse can auscultate the abdomen in four quadrants. Normal bowel sounds will be low and have a gurgling sound. There should be approximately five in the span of one minute. Hypoactive bowel sounds could indicate an ileus, and hyperactive bowel sounds could indicate multiple GI symptoms or GI distress, such as irritable bowel syndrome. To assess for an abdominal aortic aneurysm, the nurse should place the diaphragm of the stethoscope just above the umbilicus, or the belly button. Then the nurse can move the stethoscope about two centimeters up and two centimeters to the left. This will assess for a renal brewery. The nurse can then do it again two centimeters up and two centimeters to the right to assess the other kidney for a renal brewery. The presence of a renal brewery can indicate renal arterial atherosclerosis, and a brewery will sound like a trill when you auscultate. Next, it is important to percuss the abdomen as this can reveal any masses or splenomegaly. The nurse should begin by percussing the liver, which should sound dull. 
Then the nurse should move from the top of the liver downward to the bowel and over the abdomen. The differences in sounds are important to note. Air-filled spaces like the stomach should sound light, whereas solid structures should sound dull. When palpating the abdomen, pay special attention to the right lower quadrant, also known as McBurney's point. This is where the appendix is located, and tenderness here could indicate appendicitis. Ask the patient about their bowel habits. Ask the patient about frequency and consistency. Bowel movements typically occur one to three times a day and should be soft and formed. Ask the patient about any genitourinary problems they are having. Ask them about frequency of urination, color of urine, and any burning sensations they may be having. These could indicate problems like a urinary tract infection. Finally, you will test the patient's reflexes. Have the patient sit, letting their legs dangle loosely. Using the reflex hammer, tap it against the patient's knee, just below the kneecap. This should trigger a patellar reflex. Next, test the patient's Achilles reflex by having the patient extend their leg and tap the plantar surface of the ball of the foot. The absence of these reflexes could indicate damage to the central nervous system. This concludes the nursing assessment of the general patient. While this is an extensive list of assessments, in no way is it a completely comprehensive list of every possible thing the nurse could assess for during a patient evaluation. More complex assessments can be made based on which part of the body has abnormal findings. I hope you're able to take this information to your practice as a nurse. Thanks!